alligator, I believe. That's an alligator. Um, they, uh, they, but it's a gigantic alligator, or uh, python. And I think this is kind of neat, because how they do this is they constrict around an animal, and they start to make things uncomfortable. And then, eventually, it makes it to where the animal can't function anymore because the bones are crushed. And finally, the animal asphyxiates, and the snake can eat it. And it almost makes them give up. There comes a point when you, you see it, uh, and I watched the video, they, they quit struggling, and then they just let the snake take over it because it just wants to be out of the constriction. And if any of you are thinking that this sounds kind of like my life, this message is for you. Because sometimes... The things of life can seem really constricting. We can get so overcome by what's going on around us that it feels like we're being choked, like we, we, we can't move. Today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about getting rid of the things that are constricting us around our life. I wanted to open with this verse. This is in Galatians 4.28. It's one of those great times when the last part of a chapter and the first part of a chapter probably needed to be put together because they, they kind of make a complete idea. But listen, it says, And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaiah, Isaac, but you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law, just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. But what do scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. The Galatians had a problem. Paul had told them about this wondrous Savior in the form of Jesus that came to set them free to fulfill the law. And, and all he asked was that they learn to love. But then the do-gooders came in. The, the ones that wanted Jesus and. Jesus and. Jesus wasn't enough, you still need to be keeping the law. And they started putting restrictions on them. They, they started trying to tell him that, well, you're, I think you're probably saved, but you're not saved. You're not a great Christian. You're a good Christian, but you're not a great Christian. And Paul decided to write a letter to correct that attitude. He said, they're trying to put the law that they grew up with, a.k.a., as we would say in this point, religion, the religion that they grew up with, they're trying to put upon you to make you more like them. And Paul's saying, no, it's Jesus. You are a son through the covenant, through a new covenant established by Jesus, and you have freedom. And he said, and you've been set free. So why are you wanting to get tangled up? You can't really see it real well, but I've got a guy back there, and he looks like he's been attacked by wires. And he's completely covered in the, in the, in the picture, in the background of this picture. And I thought, man, that's so apropos, because, you know, you get so much of that stuff around you, you can't do anything. But that's what they were trying to do to the people in Galatia. Not the one that's 100 miles, or I don't know, 50 miles over this way. It's the, the, the one over in uh, uh, it would be Asia, I guess it would be. Turkey, thank you, Asia, yes. But anyways, yes, the Galatia. And he's saying, you didn't come to a second-class gospel. Just because you're not Jewish doesn't mean that you live a second-class gospel. He said, no. He said, you're, a son, you are, you're representatives of the son born by the free woman. A child of the promise, and you've been set free. What are the things that are restricting us? 
What are these things that restrict us? As we look at this, it says, one of the things that we looked at that, that, that's constricting us is debt. How about people's expectations? Poverty or poor thinking? And one of the big ones, our mouths. Ooh. These things are, can constrict us. Each one of these things can get to be so much that it feels like we're choking. Is any of these ringing true? You don't have to say anything, but think about that. Is any of these ringing true in my life? Yeah. Let's look at them each, though. So debt. God's idea on debt is that we don't have any. And I know that's tough. Because we need, th we need certain things to get around. You know, a car is awful handy if you have to go to work, especially when it's this cold. But God's idea is that we wouldn't be under debt. In Romans 13, 7, he says, Give to everyone that you, what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them. And give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Owe no, nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's love. He says, don't let your debt control you. Don't let your taxes control you. That's kind of an apropos message right now, since we're all getting ready to bandy that about. Don't let it control you. You're a child of God. Pay your taxes and be free. Try to live out of debt because they own you. And, and he even goes so far in one another scripture, he says that you shouldn't even try to secure debt for other people because why should they come take your bed if that person defaults? He wants you to be able to be out from underneath people because the mentality of all these, all four of these, is that you're not your own. You're not your own. When you made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you said, I'm not my own anymore. I belong to him. And when you're in debt to people, you belong to someone else. They own you. And they have every right that if you ever default on that debt, they can take you to court and eventually have you thrown in jail in some cases. You're not your own anymore. We're becoming a different people. Now here's one that seems to be really effective to people is people pleasing. Worried about people's expectations. How do you get rid of that? Well guess what? It's the same answer as the one before it. You're not your own. You don't belong to them any more than they belong to you. You belong to God. Let me read this verse and then I'll throw another one at you. Um, Galatians 1.10, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of pe people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. Paul says to the Galatians, I'm not trying to please anybody here. I'm not answering to another authority except to God. And I have to do what he put me on this earth to do, which is to take his message to all the far corners of the empire. Everywhere I can go, I have to take God's love with me. And so that, because I answer to him, I don't have to answer to anybody else. In another place, he talks about that we're bond servants. He, he compares it to being a slave to God. And he said that we, we should work as we would work for God. Because that person that... It, would own us doesn't control us. We're controlled by God. Remember that whole verse that Jesus talks about that if somebody makes you go with them a mile, go with them two miles. If somebody strikes you on one cheek, offer him the other. They don't own you. And you need to show them that I, I belong to God. And part of that's showing that, you know, if they're, if they're trying to take control over you, and say that you're, you're, you belong to me, you do more than what's expected to show that they, that they don't control who you are.
John 5, Jesus says, your approval means nothing to me. He was talking to the Pharisees, or as we would call them, the ultra church of that day, the people that were holier than thou. He said, your approval means nothing to me. Because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name, and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. Jesus says, I'm not here on my own name. I came, I came because of God. Same as Paul told the Galatians. I'm not here because of you. I'm here for God. God told me to go, so I go. Jesus says, I teach what the Father would have me speak. In fact, he even said that. He said that I only say what the Father tells me to say. And he said, and yet you won't receive me because I don't have some name attached to me. I don't have some other great teacher attached to me. And in other words, he's saying, this is the difference between me and you, is you, you only prefer intellectuals and, and who they would approve of. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. And I'm giving you truth. And yet you won't hear because I don't, I'm not approved by one of the other rabbis, one of the rabbis you've heard a bit of. You're not made to please people. You're made to please God. And when you please God, you'll find other people are drawn to you because it can become so restricting. I, I don't know... Um, I, I don't know that men do this as much, but some, I, I remember mom saying that w women don't dress for men, they dress for other women because, and I always think about that. I'm thinking, you mean you just dress that way just so that other people will approve of you? And, and it, you know, it just kind of boggled my mind. You don't have to please other people. You just have to please God. And ultimately, most of those people wouldn't do anything for you if you were ever in a bind. But they'll talk about you if you don't look right. Right? A poverty mentality. And honestly, this is probably where most of this sprung up. So, what you all don't know is that this past week, I got involved in a situation that came up. I, uh, uh, there was a guy that came by the hospital and he's trying to put his life back together. He's, uh, um, he's a former alcoholic, been a, a year and nine months sober. And he's, he's, he got himself a job over at GT and he, uh, he's, he's, tr he's decided he's going to put his life back together. He's 57 years old. And so me and a couple of the other chaplains, we, we've been trying to help him this past week. And, and I, I had the privilege to go up and pick him up this on um, Monday. And man, I was so proud of him. I, uh, I, I pulled up there and he was waiting outside, ready to go. Uh, he had to be at work at 8. I picked him up at 7.30 in the morning and, and I took him to GT that morning. And he was excited and ready to go. And the next person, they picked him up on Tuesday. But you know what they said? They said, there he was. He's, he's ready to go. He's got his stuff. He's, he's ready to go. Wednesday, I picked him up. They took him out to GT. He was, there. he was ready to go. But then Thursday came. On Thursday, he told the guy that picked him up, he said, I don't want to go to work today. He says, I don't, I don't want to go. And we're like, and, and Mark's like, oh, okay. And he said, it's, he said, I'm a 57-year-old man. And he said, this job is too hard for me. And, and I understand. I, know, I understand that, you know, factory work is, is, it can be very hard on the body. And he is 57. I mean, all those things. But the problem is, is that he doesn't have any other options. He doesn't have a place to live. He doesn't, he, he can't, he doesn't have any money to buy food, and he doesn't, and various and assorted things. 
but he's decided he's going to cut off his his possibility to get free of that to 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 get free on dependence on other people but but the the other part of this problem is is that he's always lived on dependence of other people and he's trying to change he wanted to change his mentality and he made it four days three days actually three days Now, that's an extreme example. But, we all can sometimes have that when we live paycheck to paycheck. The poverty mentality is that if I have money, I need to spend it. And and that's not how you're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be living like that. We're not supposed to be living with this idea that... that, uh, I'll just buy whatever I want and hope it all comes out well. We have to live well. In fact, the Bible talks about this, the, the parable of the stewards. And the idea of the steward is that they managed the money of the master. And if they just went around spending all the money, they wouldn't be a good steward. Now, a good steward puts the money where it needs to go to make sure the house always has enough. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Because once again, we're servants of God. The last thing we're going to talk about today is your mouth. Ooh. This is the problem that this guy had. He, so what, uh, another part of this story is he was in a rehab place. And... And he apparently had something to say about how they ran the place. And they said, well, there's the door. He had free food, shelter, and, and they helped him get a job and everything else. And he started criticizing them. And they said, well, there's the door. So he walked out of it to when he didn't have anywhere to go. And so now he needed help. And we were looking for a place to put him up at. And he said, I can't go over there. He said, I... I I said some things to the owner there, or the, the lady that ran the place, and she said I couldn't come back. And I said, so your mouth got you again, huh? And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we look at this verse in James. He said, indeed, we all make mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way james james says that our tongue is so important that if you could learn to control that you could have control of your life wow what a statement there's very little statements like that in the bible where it promises that you could have control of your own life if you could just get control of that one thing But James believes that getting control of your tongue is one of the hardest things that there is. He compares it to the uh, the tiny rudder on the back of a huge ship, managing to turn, being the thing that would turn a whole ship. Think about that: is your tongue turning you in wrong directions because you're not controlling it? Back then, back then there was a guy that all he did was he stood on the rudder. And it was in the back of the boat with a big thing. And his job was to hold that rudder steadily. Because if he, like, started leaning on it this way, well, guess what? The boat's going to turn that way. Or, 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 you know, or something happens and he gets to talking to this guy over here and starts this, it turns the other way. He's got to keep his mind on what he's doing and keep that rudder steadily. Because that's what turns the whole boat. <laughs> Nothing else on that bo- boat matters when you're actually going somewhere almost as much as just that rudder. I mean, you've got to have wind and everything, but, you know, nowadays you've got a, a motor that runs everything, but, you know, that rudder still turns the boat. And he compares that to our tongue, meaning that our tongue can get us in trouble. Have you ever seen somebody that's tongue has got them in trouble? Let me, let me tell you how that conversation usually starts talking to me, t- telling me, well, my family won't talk to me anymore. My friends won't talk to me. And, and nobody at work likes me. And their tongue has got them in trouble. 
We all know that you get in trouble at work if you if you say the wrong thing. You could go spend some time in the HR office and you could be out of a job if you don't learn to control it. All because of a little tongue. Most That's probably the most things that HR people, I went to school for HR, the most things they say that people get in trouble for is not crazy things that they do at work, it's the things that they say. They, they, they say the wrong thing to the wrong person and suddenly they're bringing them in to talk to them and giving them a warning and saying one more time and you're out. But that's something that can constrict us. Our tongue causes consequences. So what's the solution? I don't mean to be dim, doom and gloom. What's the solution to all of this? Well, guess what? Jesus provided that too. Here's this verse in Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Guess what? Did you know that if you have self-control, you're probably not going to be in debt? Did you know if you have self-control and joy, your tongue may not get you in as much trouble? Each one of these things solves the things that we're talking about. All those four, those four things that constrict us. Each one of these things are, are solving those four things. It's giving us a different mentality. And you know what else it does? It's the Father's mark on our life. It doesn't just solve our problems. It solves other people's problems because it puts the Father's mark on your life. How many people do you know exhibit all seven of these? Can you think of many? I'll just tell you, it's very rare. I can't think of very many. I feel like I know a few people. But you don't see people that exhibit all seven of, the, of those things because we don't let the Father work in us. It's like we accepted His free gift of salvation, but we said, I've got it from here. I'll do it my way. It was never intended to be that. The Father's mark was always meant to be on us. We were always meant to start to exhibit these seven things. Do you know how we get the seven, these seven things? It's by relationship. It's by getting close. It's by spending time hearing about Him. It's about spending time praying with Him. And, 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 hear, and, and listening for his voice. It's about a listening to that still small voice in our spirit that says, you shouldn't do that. My problem is, is that my mouth moves faster than that still small voice. So then I have to go and I have to apologize to people for what I just said. Because my still small voice says, you shouldn't have said that. But I've already got the words out of my mouth. <laughs> But I'm learning. And I've noticed, that I, I, I've noticed that as this has gone on, I get a little bit better about holding my tongue. Trust me, there's some things you hear in, in hospital rooms that may, you want to respond to so bad, and you go, I don't think I need to say that right now. So I'm learning. But, praise God. Let's have, let's have our worship team come up. We're going to sing one more song, and then we're... We're going to, uh, I'll come back and we'll close. One thing that's kind of been, I've been thinking about this week, I want you to be thinking about this too, is, is I was listening to a patient tell me many of their, th how many things they've dealt with in this past 2023. And before we played, uh, before we prayed, and, and I wanted to pray for them to have a better year, but before we prayed, that line to that uh, to uh, Amazing Grace comes in, the one about the third verse, I, that says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. And, and I said, think about that. You've had a lot of things go on this year, this past year, 2023. We're not too removed. Probably some of you are still writing it on your uh, papers and checks and everything else still. You've not 
transitioned over to 2024. But you may have had a lot of things in this past year, but that doesn't mean that 2024 can't be different. You've already come through so much. Believe in God that He wants to help bring you home. Restricted today as your life collapsed in on top of you and it's threatening to suffocate you. If the answer is yes, we'd like to pray for you today. pressure is acting up, but you've already brought her through COVID, you brought her through heart problems, you brought her through all these different things, but she, and she trusts you, so we just pray over this blood pressure to help things that are trying to constrict her and, and, and stop her from being able to go forward, so we just believe that your presence is over her, in her, and with her, 
We ask for healing for her body. Father, that you continue to help her to gain back her health day by day. And we just thank you that you don't let her walk this path alone, but that she walks with our prayers and she walks with your blessing. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You're welcome. Anybody else like prayer before we close up today? All right. Well, let me pray over y'all. Stay with me. Father, I ask you to let my words echo where they need to echo. That, Father, in the lives that things are going on, where, they, where they, it does stop them, that the, their problems do stop them. I just ask that they would hear those words and come seek you out. Father, I know I'm not the end-all, be-all in knowledge of all this, but I know that you are. And that, Father, you can speak to each person's heart here and tell them the goodness that you have for each of them. I thank you that we got to be here together as a family and worship and hear your word today. I just ask that you would just go with these people, be with them, lead them, guide them, and direct them in all their paths this week. Let us go, let us go out of victory and let us come back in with victory. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Love you so much.